All right, so I'm going to kick us off here. And all right. So good evening and thank you all for joining us here tonight. My name is Anna Hopkins and I'm a consultant acting as a moderator for today's session. I'm calling in today from Saskatoon on Treaty 6 territory here, the traditional lands of the Cree, Soto, Dene, Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota and Métis nations. And I'm happy to be, be here with everybody tonight. <clears throat> uh, so on Tuesday, SAS Power announced that it's gonna start exploring the possibility of siting a small modular nuclear reactor in one of two study areas. And we know you're joining us tonight probably because you have some questions about what this means, whether you live in one of these study areas or elsewhere in the province. So we hope this session tonight can provide some clarity about why SAS Power is considering nuclear power, uh, what a small modular reactor is, and what the process is going to look like moving forward. And it's quite a long process. Uh, we're just at the start. So there's a lot of studies, consultation and engagement activities, and a lot of more hard work uh, before a final decision will be made in 2029. So in a moment, I'll be introducing you to Darcy Holderness and Nanette um, Solomon who are both with SAS Power uh, to share some more. But first, a few notes for you on the format for tonight. So the first uh, bit, uh, about half hour or so will be presentation from Nanette and Darcy. And then our remaining half hour will be a QA, and a And we'll, we'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. And uh, if there's lots and lots of questions and folks want to stick around a little longer, we're, we're all happy to stay on the line um, to, meet, to meet all of your questions. So Zoom webinar is a little bit different in terms than a Zoom meeting. So if you have questions, we ask that you please use the Q&A box. Um, the Q&A icon should be at the bottom right of your screen. And if you click it, it pops up and it'll show you where you can type in your question and then you press submit. Um, and from there, uh, one of our background moderators will either you know, click a button that says, OK, we're going to be asking this live. Uh, when we get to the Q&A or, or someone may type a response if there's something um, you know kind of straightforward that we can quickly reply to. So please use the Q&A for all questions. Don't put them in the chat box. Um, the chat box we really want to reserve just for people if you're having technical issues uh, and we have folks on the back end who can help support you through those issues if they come up. So um, you'll be looking for sending a message to, to the panelists or to Karan um, who can help you out with your tech issues if they happen. So please, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box um, and leave the chat just for technical um, concerns. So as I said, at the end um, of the presentations, we'll have a good amount of time to go through those questions. Uh, feel free to add questions as they come up for you um, throughout the presentation, although we may, you know, we may clarify some of them uh, just in, in the, the nature of the presentation itself. So I think that's it on my housekeeping here. Uh, so what I will do is just turn it over next to Nanette Solomon, who is the manager of supply planning with SAS Power. Thanks, Anna. I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. SAS Power's work reaches the ancestral lands of many nations. As a Crown utility, we reaffirm our relationship with the peoples of these lands and honor our shared determination to preserve the lands for generations to come. Over this past year, 300 SAS Power employees participated in a full day Indigenous awareness training program. Our leadership team recognizes the importance of increasing knowledge of our province's shared history as a good starting point to build on. Before we get into the details of the SMR project, I would just like to share with you an overview of our future power needs and the work required to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions. SAS Power's mission remains to ensure reliable, sustainable, and cost-effective power for our customers and the communities we serve. But the energy transition is challenging. Reliable, affordable, and now clean electricity is fundamental to ensuring our economy continues to grow and our standard of living is preserved and enhanced. Fast Power has already been working extensively to decarbonize Saskatchewan's electricity system. We're increasing our renewable capacity up to 50% by 2030. We are on track to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to 50% below our 2005 levels by 2030. And we're planning our system for a net zero future. 
So this means modernizing our grid and adding significant infrastructure to support new generation, ensure our systems remain secure and pave the way for additional renewables and innovation, such as energy storage, electric vehicles and increased customer generation. Beyond modernizing our grid, we are also investing in many other areas. We have more than doubled our wind capacity in the last year, and we have a lot more planned. As well, our first battery energy storage system will be installed in Regina by next year. And we're doing the work now to ensure that supply options like carbon capture and storage and nuclear small modular reactors are available to us as supply options in the future. We do recognize that more needs to be done. We've been planning to get to net zero by 2050. However, proposed federal regulations called the Clean Electricity Regulations will require all electric utilities to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2035. In Saskatchewan right now, we feel that that's simply not possible. There are financial, technological and logistical constraints that prevent SAS power from getting to net zero by 2035. But we are continuing to evolve our long-term plans and we're working on how we can get to net zero sooner than 2050. In the short term, we have a limited number of options available in Saskatchewan that we can decide today to build. These include distributed energy resources, which are, for example, small scale solar panels on people's homes, um, demand side management, which is essentially energy efficiency measures. These are good options, but they will play a smaller role in the near term. I've already mentioned battery energy storage. We are starting to get into that technology, but it's still developing. So our uptake will increase as the technology progresses and the costs improve. Right now, only imports and natural gas generation are available to us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the amount of energy we can import does have a limit. So this means that as we work to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by significantly increasing the amount of renewables on our system, we will still need to rely on additional natural gas generation to be there when the wind and the sun are not. As we approach 2030, the picture becomes less clear. And there are a, lot, a number of options that we are investigating for the future. And this includes small modular reactors, which we are here to learn more about today. But there will be other opportunities to hear your thoughts on what options and solutions are best for Saskatchewan. So if you would like to learn more, or participate in our long-term planning process, please go to saspower.com slash engage. And now I'll turn it over to Darcy, who's the manager of small modular reactor development so that we can learn more about that. Thanks, Darcy. Uh, thank you, Nanette. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Darcy Holderness. I am the manager of, of the SMR development project, which is one of the supply options that may be required in the future as, as we think about uh, net zero GHG emissions uh, from our electricity production, uh, as Nanette pointed out. So the, the reality of climate change is that, that we have to start investing in and leveraging many new tools and technologies if we're gonna drastically reduce emissions. Uh, and this is critical. It's critical to ensure our, our kids and grandkids can enjoy the same quality of life that we've enjoyed uh, over our lifetimes. Uh, and nuclear power might be one of those technologies that helps us uh, tackle our, our energy transition and our, our movement towards net zero in Saskatchewan. Nuclear has been a safe and reliable part of Canada's electricity system since the 1970s. Uh, and those provinces that do have nuclear energy today uh, have committed to keeping it part of their energy supply well into the next century. And so that there's lots of reasons that we and, and many places around the world are, are taking another very careful look at nuclear power. Uh, the first is, is nuclear supplies reliable baseload power. Uh, and so just by way of background, we, we think of two types of, of generation to power our grid in Saskatchewan, baseload options and peaking power. Baseload is the type of power that runs all day, every day, and it, it's really the backbone of our electricity system. And to date, we've relied on fossil fuels to provide that for us, uh, coal and natural gas. The second is, is peaking power. Uh, and th these types of uh, generation options we run when it's very hot, very cold, or we have high load demand throughout the day. Uh, and we meet that peak demand through, through those generation options. 
So really we think of nuclear and small modular reactors or SMRs as base load power option. So in addition to running reliably uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, nuclear does not emit greenhouse gases during operation. And that's what's responsible for the climate change uh, that we're dealing with today. A nuclear does create other forms of waste and those waste products need to be captured and carefully managed, but even they don't contribute to, to climate change and the way you can manage it uh, doesn't impact uh, our GHG emissions profile in the province. And lastly, up until recently, a lot of the challenges with adopting nuclear in Saskatchewan has been the, the cost and scale, the size of conventional nuclear reactors. Typical conventional reactors are in the range of, of 1,000 megawatts per reactor. Uh, and really, that's, that's difficult to integrate into a grid uh, our size. So a technologically breakthrough, technological breakthroughs uh, over the past decade uh, in the form of these small modular reactors are changing that narrative and changing the feasibility for nuclear power, which is making the cost uh, more predictable and, and more affordable for jurisdictions like us in Saskatchewan. So it's really the size that, uh, of one single reactor that makes them suitable potentially for Saskatchewan. But in a lot of ways, nuclear is no different than any other form of, of major thermal electricity generation. Uh, very simply put, uh, a nuclear reactor produces heat uh, and we, we take that heat and we make steam, uh, just like the steam from uh, our kettles at home. Uh, very similar to our, our coal-fired gas power plants or our gas power stations, uh, the pressure from that steam we use to spin a turbine and, and that turbine then produces electricity. So where nuclear is really different is, is the way it generates that heat to make steam. Heat is created by splitting uranium atoms uh, as opposed to burning fossil fuels. Uh, and that process is called nuclear fission. Uh, fission is, is the process by which the nucleus of an atom splits into two or more smaller, lighter nuclei. Uh, and as that atom splits, it releases a large amount of energy in the form of heat and radiation. Uh, and it also causes a chain reaction within the reactor. And we need that chain reaction to be sustained to make sure it, it continues to generate that heat and, and we get the, the reliable power that we're looking for out of the facility. So, so part of the benefit of nuclear power is, is it's a very dense form of energy. So you get a lot, uh, a lot of electricity can be attained with a small amount of fuel uh, and a small footprint like we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, one pellet uh, of uranium that is about the size of a gummy bear, uh, as shown there, and would weigh about the same as a AA battery, uh, that one uranium pellet creates as much energy as one ton of coal uh, or 120 gallons of oil. So fewer than 10 of these pellets, uh, think 10 gummy bears, uh, would be needed to power the average Canadian household for an entire year. And so we're, we're new to nuclear power generation in Saskatchewan, but we do have a, a strong foundation in uranium mining and, and nuclear science and innovation as well. Uh, most people are aware we're home to, to the world's largest, or we are one of the world's largest producers of high-grade uranium. Uh, and that uranium is the mineral that's used to produce nuclear fuel. So the picture you can see here is the MacArthur mine uh, in northern Saskatchewan. And, and our northern uranium mines contribute very significantly to our economy. Uh, that's to the tune of, of about $500 million annually, and, and it makes up 2,000 jobs uh, in northern Saskatchewan. About 75% of our uranium is exported, and it's used around the world in, in nuclear power reactors uh, for energy production. Uh, and most of the rest stays within Canada, and we use it in our, our power uh, nuclear power plants that are located in central and eastern Canada. So in addition, we, we do have a foundation here of, of nuclear innovation and nuclear science as well. Uh, reactors, uh, uh, some of you may know that there was a research reactor that operated at the University of Saskatchewan for almost 40 years. It, it was called known as the Slowpoke 2 reactor. Uh, and with that operation, the universities also have a, what's called the Sylvia Fedoric Center for Nuclear Innovation. Uh, and so we're a leader in Saskatchewan in nuclear research development and training. Uh, these reactors are used in, in many forms of medicine. Uh, isotopes produced by reactors help us diagnose and treat diseases like cancer. 
Uh, they also are used to sterilize medical equipment and, and prevent infections. Uh, and they're even used in food preservation to, to prevent spoiling. Some countries with water shortages use, use isotopes uh, to help find and manage their water resources. But we are new to electricity production with nuclear power, uh, but, but Canada is not new. So Canada's, uh, from all of Canada, 15% of our electricity in, in Canada comes from nuclear power today. And if you look at Ontario, 60% of their electricity production is, is from nuclear power. And so Canada is what's known, uh, known as a tier one nuclear nation. And so we mine uranium, uh, we use that uh, as nuclear fuel and power reactors and research and, and, and development. Uh, we produce medical isotopes that we export around the world and, and we store and manage all of the waste products that's produced from these facilities uh, all in-house. And, that, and that's allowed us to also uh, have one of the a globally respected federal regulator uh, for nuclear operations in Canada, which is known as the CNSC, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. So what is an SMR? Uh, like, our, like our phones and our home computers, uh, many things get smaller and, and technologically advanced with time. And so we're looking at, at nuclear power from small modular reactors or SMRs uh, in that same type of thinking as, as a small version of, of conventional nuclear power plants. Many parts are, uh, for an SMR are, would be built in a factory and then assembled on site. Uh, that's the modular aspect and that helps to, to manage construction costs uh, and, and risks associated with uh, these projects. Once built, SMRs are expected to operate for about 60 years. Uh, at a site before that site would be decommissioned and then formally abandoned. So that, that's a similar lifetime to our coal plants that we operate in Saskatchewan and, and much longer than our natural gas facilities or our wind or solar installations. So SMRs are, are gonna provide about 300 megawatts of electricity production uh, per facility. Uh, and that's enough energy to power about 300,000 homes. Uh, it's expected that the SMRs will need less than 1% uh, of the land area if you compare with other low carbon and renewable sources to generate that same amount of power. And that really speaks to, to how dense the, the energy is. So it comes with a small footprint. Uh, the size of the reactor uh, containment area itself would be about the same size as a school gymnasium. But it really, it's the electrical output that makes them the right size for Saskatchewan's grid. Uh, th at 300 megawatts, it's about the same size as our larger coal units uh, and our new natural gas facilities, which allows them to integrate into our grid in, in, a, in an economical and cost-effective fashion. So if you've been following the SMR project, we, we did announce a preferred technology that we're considering for deployment here, and, and that's G Atachi's BWRX 300 SMR. Uh, that's shown in this picture as a concept sketch. So this is what the facility might look like for one single 300 megawatt reactor. SMRs are an emerging, uh, an emerging clean energy technology, but many are based on, on designs that are well known and, and in some cases have been used for decades. Uh, the, the BWR X300, the X uh, in that title represents it's the, it's the 10th generation of a boiling water reactor that has been operated uh, with Giatachi uh, in North America for decades. So just to kind of summarize that up, uh, we've talked about what nuclear power is and how it works, but really why it might be a good fit for Saskatchewan is what's shown here. So it it's, it's provides that base load, reliable energy, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week when we need it. Uh, there are no GHG emissions associated with operations, so it's considered an emissions-free uh, generation option. Uh, with the, the output with the smaller reactors, it, it makes it the right size for our grid. And then we're building from, from our uranium mining experience and, and our nuclear innovation and science, we, we can build those, those areas. Uh, when you, if we're going to look to deploy power reactors in the province, uh, we're going to need to supplement that with with uh, research and development programs, new education and training initiatives. Uh, we'll need to produce high quality people that can manage these assets and, and safely construct and operate them through the lifetime. And that comes with, with a benefit to Saskatchewan. 
all of that needs to needs to be supplemented and created and and really with that comes indigenous partnership opportunities uh, and an opportunity for meaningful reconciliation in the province is really what this pro project represents. Uh, they're also they're small reactors, but but they're still mega construction projects, and and that comes with with economy for the province as well in the forms of of supply chain opportunities and uh, temporary construction jobs and permanent operational jobs as well. So we, uh, that kind of introduces what SMRs are and how nuclear power works and why it might be a good fit for Saskatchewan. Uh, we'll, we'll get in now into what the site selection process is going to look like, uh, what we've launched uh, with our announcement this week in Saskatchewan and, and what's to come with, with that process. So in 2021, we entered what we're calling the planning phase uh, for nuclear power with SMRs. Uh, and we think that's gonna take eight or nine years to get through. Uh, so we're not looking at making a decision on whether to build this type of technology until much later. Uh, it'll be 2029 before we decide to enter the construction phase uh, and then operate after that or not. Uh, and so we have a lot of work to do between now and then to get ready for that decision. Uh, and one of the first things we're going to need is, is to find a site. So we've got a little bit more detail later on, but, but we think we'll be ready to select a site uh, in late 2024. Uh, it might go into early 2025 before we actually get through a final approvals and, and purchase the land. Uh, but that, that decision needs to happen to support uh, the impact assessment that we're going to have to do. Uh, we'll have to go through a full federal and provincial impact assessment. Uh, and we'll need a, a few other licenses from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission before we're, we're deemed qualified and ready to, to construct and operate that, this type of reactor. So it's, it's a lot of technical and environmental studies that we need to do to ensure safety and viability of the project at the site that, that we would potentially select. So that, that site selection criteria, we, we've been doing a lot of work over the first year of this planning phase. And, and that work has been to understand the requirements of, of the technology itself uh, in terms of how you, how you would find a site, uh, the requirements of the regulations. Uh, there's a lot of regulations in Canada when you're siting a nuclear power reactor. Uh, and then we need, to, we need to look at the requirements of the business. Uh, where do we have an, the capacity and the ability to move this amount of power around the province or where do we need it? Or how can we locate it close to our major load centers so that you don't have too many losses when you're moving the energy around? And this is the type of criteria that, that's summarized here at a very high level. This is regional criteria that we look for in the area that would, would potentially host the facility. So you need a large lake or a large reservoir, and that's used as a, as a cooling water supply to the power plant, very similar to how we operate our coal-fired power stations or our natural gas facilities. Uh, you need that, that cooling water source uh, to help manage that, that operation. We're also looking to be close to existing power infrastructure uh, or those areas where we have high demands of power in the province. Uh, the other thing you need from a, from a regulatory perspective and, and from an a, a economic perspective is the ability to attract and sustain a, a workforce uh, to construct and operate the plant over the long term. And so there's, there's infrastructure that you look for that, that helps to manage that workforce and, and the livelihood of that workforce through, through those phases. So you think about services uh, like transportation services, uh, emergency services can help supplement operations. If we have fire protection uh, locally that we can, we can supplement with our operation models, then, then that helps with the business case and that makes that region an attractive place for this type of, of power facility. We also, of course, we map out environmentally sensitive lands, uh, critical habitats within the provinces, archeological resources and heritage resources. And, and we make sure as we look for a site that we, we avoid any impact on, on areas like that. And so we've done a lot of that work and, and we've identified two regions that, that meet this criteria uh, and could support the project. Uh, and so, that criteria was informed by, by a lot of things and, and we're ready to now look for potential sites within these regions that could, uh, uh, could host the facility. 
Uh, and so both of the regions that we've selected have characteristics that meet that criteria. There's large bodies of wadi water, uh, there's existing power and, and infrastructure that could support the, the potential workforce that's needed for the facility. Uh, and so we've identified the elbow region and the Estevan region as having the, the most opportunity with the least amount of risk and impact for this potential project. But the work is, is really just starting now. Um, so just to further define these areas, this, this shows you what the elbow study area looks like. The solid orange line in here is, is what we're calling the potential siting area. So the area within that solid orange line is where we'll physically locate the SMR. And that's a 10 kilometer radius around the water body that, that we're looking at here, which in this case is Lake Diefenbaker, right from Gardner Dam down to the, the Capel Dam. Uh, the area outside of that uh, is a dotted line with a lighter gray sh shading. That's, that's a 30 kilometer radius outside of the siting area. And that's what we're calling the, the study area, the proposed study area. So federal regulations, uh, when you're looking to site a project like this and an impact assessment, require that you study an area much larger than the site itself. And so we're going to start with a 30 kilometer radius and, and that might change as we engage and learn more about these regions and, and where there are opportunities or challenges and, and it'll be finalized as we get into the impact assessment process. So the other study area shown here is the Estevan area. Uh, and again, you can see potential siting area with the solid orange line, and that's a, a 10 kilometer radius around Rafferty Reservoir, Boundary Dam Reservoir, and, and Grant Divine Lake. Uh, and then our study area here is, is a 30 kilometer radius around, around those areas. So what do we have to do? Uh, how are we going to analyze these areas and evaluate them for for potential sites within that we could, could locate the facility. Uh, and so the process that we're gonna undertake uh, over the next two or, or two and a half years to find that site uh, is gonna take a lot of work. Uh, we're gonna need to collect a lot of data. Uh, we need to gather information about what matters to municipalities, residents, stakeholders, and rights holders within these areas. And uh, we'll ensure that, that all residents, all communities that, that are here are well informed and have a voice in the pro process. As we look for a site and make decisions uh, within these areas, uh, we also have the potential to adversely impact treaty and Aboriginal rights. And for that reason, SAS Power, as an agent of the Provincial Crown, we have a duty to consult and accommodate any potentially impacted First Nations and Métis locals. And so that consultation process is gonna focus on how rights are exercised within these proposed regions, so that as we look for, for a site, uh, we can avoid or mitigate any potential adverse impacts. Uh, we'll contact First Nations and Métis locals who are known or are located near the study areas or known to exercise rights in and around these areas. Uh, they'll have actually already received a notification letter from, from SAS Power inviting them to that, that consultation process. So at, at the same time, of course, we'll be gathering uh, community input uh, from, from everyone that lives and works and plays in these areas. And we'll also be collecting more technical data. And together, the technical data, engagement data, feedback through the consultation uh, will be used to help us inform and narrow down these regions to potential uh, half sections of land that we would look to develop. And so we're looking to find two half sections of land that each could be developed for this, this project uh, by the end of 2023. Uh, and then we'll take those two parcels and we'll do a lot more study and analysis throughout 2023 or into 2024, sorry, uh, and looking to select one of those two by the end of 2024. Or it might go into 2025 before we actually purchase that land and, and start getting into the impact assessment from there. So it's important that this is, this is an early, early thing we need to support the planning process, but, but things don't end uh, after we find the site by any means. So this gives you a sense of, of the longer term planning phase. And, and you can see we're looking to make that transition to construction potentially by, by the end of 2029. And that puts the, the first SMR into operation around the mid 2030s. 
So once we find our site through through the process we just talked about, uh, we'll, that'll be late 2024 or early 2025. And, and that paves way for us to enter the, the formal impact assessment with the federal and provincial regulators. Uh, we'll also look for those licenses from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Uh, we'll need the license to prepare a site and, and a construction and operation license before you can transition to those other phases. Uh, at the same time, we'll, we'll have extensive engagement. Uh, our, our Indigenous stakeholder and public engagement program will be ongoing uh, right from the, the early onset, right through the planning phase and, and into eventual construction if we make the decision to, to build out this, this type of facility. So we have a lot of work to do, a lot of regulatory planning, uh, the site selection and our engagement initi initiatives. And all the, main, all the while, we're going to be monitoring uh, what the projected costs are going to be. So what is the cost of the construction phase and, and the power that will come out once we get into operation is obviously a very important thing. Uh, so we can make uh, a very well-informed decision come 2029. So what's next? Uh, we'll take a little bit of time to talk about what's coming up uh, for the project and how you can get involved. Uh, we'll also we'll have ongoing public and Indigenous engagement. Uh, we'll be conducting a lot of field studies within these two regions and preparing for that environmental and impact assessment uh, that's going to come. But we're, we're very mindful that decisions about power in Saskatchewan and decisions on the SMR project itself uh, can impact everyone in Saskatchewan. Uh, and, and so we're, we're committed. Your voice does matter. Uh, we want to hear diverse views and perspectives of people across Saskatchewan, you know, as we look for a suitable site for, for a potential nuclear facility that might help us uh, in, with increasing energy demands and, and a future net zero emissions goal that's coming. And so you have a very important role to play. Uh, we need help to identify uh, environmental, social and economic impacts. Uh, and the SMR project team within SAS Power will integrate that feedback into our planning process uh, and our decision-making process on siting. And it'll also be shared with our, our regulators. So including the, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada, and the, the Environmental Assessment Branch, the provincial one at the Ministry of Environment. And we're also committed to ensuring that Aboriginal and treaty rights are protected and respected. Uh, and we'll engage and consult actively with, with First Nations and Métis communities. So I'll, I'll share some of the upcoming engagement opportunities on the next slide. Uh, one thing we did wanna point out though is, is a thing we'll be carrying out in, in parallel is what we call the regional evaluation process. And that's a process where we're looking to bring together a range of stakeholders and rights holders from each of the two study areas to help us understand local and regional perspectives on the site selection process, uh, including what what people see as, as challenges and opportunities and priorities for them uh, as we consider this project for Saskatchewan. So, so this new technology and, and the challenge of, of this energy transition that's upon us uh, really does mean opportunity. Uh, it's an exciting time for Saskatchewan and we're hoping as many people as possible will be part of our planning and, and development processes. And there's lots of ways to participate. So we'll hold a combination of virtual and in-person activities to ensure that there's many ways to access information and provide feedback back to us. Our online engagement hub, uh, which is located at saspower.com slash engage, uh, it's a great place uh, to get introductory information to the, the future of power and the SMR project in particular. Uh, there's key dates on there and events that are coming up. Uh, you can participate in polls, uh, you can submit questions, share ideas, and collaborate uh, with other people in Saskatchewan uh, on those ideas and, uh, and moving forward. Uh, you can also find details there about upcoming virtual learning events uh, and that it'll, we're going to be hosting on topics related to the future supply planning uh, and nuclear power as well. I will also be attending uh, community events within these two regions uh, in the upcoming year. I will be hosting in-person engagement sessions. Uh, so keep an eye on, on the engagement hub for updated listings and information in that regard as well. So lastly, uh, if you wanna stay up to date on the project uh, and get involved in some of the upcoming learning and, and engagement opportunities, there's a few options. 
again, saspar.com slash engage, uh, visit that area. You can sign up for, for our newsletter or email updates uh, about this project in, in particular, uh, upcoming events. You can register for that online engagement hub, uh, which allows you to participate in lots of virtual engagement activities. Uh, and it really only takes a minute. Uh, next week on, on September 28th at noon, we're hosting a learning event called Our Power is Changing, where we'll look at, at how our province is currently powered and, and we'll dive deeper into some of those power supply options that Nanette talked about and how we're considering them now and into the future. Uh, so you can register for all that at saspower.com slash engage. So just, just in summary, uh, like many jurisdictions around the world, uh, we're looking at at SAS Power, we're looking at decarbonizing our electricity grid and, and reaching that net zero emissions profile as soon as we can. But there's no single technology that's gonna get us there. Uh, it's important that we, we keep all available technologies that it can ensure a clean and reliable and affordable electricity supply into the future. And so that's gonna mean more renewables, uh, utility scale energy storage, uh, conservation programs like Lynette was talking about, and potentially nuclear power. Uh, among many others. So after a lot of uh, preliminary technical work, we, we've identified the Elbow and Estevan regions as being the most technically feasible uh, locations for a small modular reactor, but, but our work is really just beginning. Uh, and so we're, we're excited now to get out there and, and talk to people uh, in these communities uh, and learn more and, and continue our, our study and evaluation and, and planning. Uh, to, to hopefully find a, a feasible site by late 2024 and, and then making that construction decision near the end of the decade, 2029. So anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much uh, for everyone's uh, time tonight. And, and we can turn it back, Anna, to you, Anna, and, and get into the Q&A session. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thanks, Darcy. Thanks both Nanette and Darcy for, for sharing their presentations here tonight. We do have some chat questions rolling in and I'd really encourage everybody um, to think about the questions you have is I want to say there's no question too big or too small maybe that's a, a tall order there are maybe there's some hard questions <clears throat> you really stumped Darcy or Nanette they may have to follow up with you but let's put that out there as a challenge um, we'd really love to see lots of questions from this group we have a good amount of time to, to tackle those together tonight so please uh, if you missed the instruction at the beginning there's an icon at the bottom right of your screen. It looks like two little um, chat or two little message uh, icons, and it says Q and A. And you can type your questions into the box that pops up when you when you hit that icon. All right. So first question I'm going to throw out is: What percentage of the total Saskatchewan electrical demand are SMRs projected to satisfy? Yeah, I, I could start with that. And percentage-wise, Nanette, you can you can maybe comment, but we're looking at 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 300 megawatts per construction decision, and so that first decision we'll make in 2029 uh, will likely be for 300 megawatt facility. Now we are going to the site that we're looking at. Uh, we're looking to license and assess impacts on that site for two reactors, which would be 600 megawatts uh, eventually from that site. Uh, but in 2029, the decision will be whether or not we build that first reactor, which is 300 megawatts. And so just to give you a rough size, our grid today is about 5,000 megawatts. And so 300 wouldn't be too impactful. Uh, but as you, as you look at, at building out more, it could become a bigger part of the pie into the 2030s. Uh, and, and our demand at that site is also questionable. So we could, we could have a larger demand for power uh, at that time as well. Okay, hey, thank you, Darcy. That's that first question. Uh, okay, so next, I have a question coming in from someone. I believe they're living in the rural municipality of Simri, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, uh, which is northwest of Estevan. And they're curious whether you'd be considering a site within that RM or whether you'd be looking closer to the city itself, uh, just kind of for their awareness. Uh, well, really, we're, we're looking for potential sites anywhere in that 10 kilometer radius or that potential siting area. So I, I apologize, I'm not too familiar with the limits of, of that particular RM, but uh, if you bridge into that, that potential area, then, then we'll be considering it, or we'd like to consider it. So, so it depends on if you're in that potential siting area, uh, 
that's a 10 kilometer radius. Uh, you don't see a lot of large thermal power stations that far away from the water body. So we started with that area, but we'd likely like to be a bit closer to the water body than, than 10 kilometers. Okay, thanks Darcy. Next question, uh, somewhat location related as well, is how does an SMR in the area influence property values? Oh, great question. Uh, I don't think we have an answer for that uh, today. Uh, there is there is socioeconomic impacts that we will have to get into and, and understand a lot more. Uh, and that's that's a big part of the impact assessment. Uh, so that, that's that's a great question and, and a good comment. Uh, I, I, I don't think I can provide an answer today, but I appreciate the question. Hey, thanks. All right, some questions on cost I'm gonna to go to next. So what is the approximate cost per kilowatt hour of production from an SMR versus a natural gas plant? Might be also a tricky one without the numbers in front of you, but maybe between you and Nanette, you can tackle that one roughly. <laughs> I, can, I can try to tackle that one. I think that's a great question. Everybody's gonna be interested in, in costs. And so the comment that I want to um, start with is that We'll be looking at this in the 2035 timeframe. So the type of natural gas generation that we're going to be looking at in that timeframe will be a little bit different than maybe than the generation that we're looking at right now. And that timeframe will be required most likely to capture most of our greenhouse gas emissions. And so that puts the cost range, you know, higher than it is today. And that's true of a lot of the options that we'll be looking at in that 2035 timeframe. All these low and non-emitting technologies that we're trying to move towards are going to cost a little bit more than they do today. Darcy, do you have any comments to add to that? Well, maybe just on, on, on the SMRs in particular, uh, it, obviously the cost is a big part of our analysis and, and making that well-informed decision. Uh, you know, we can commit, we're, we're not going to implement SMRs if it means a, a, an increase to our rates in Saskatchewan just for that technology. We'll be using to, to utilize this technology to keep our rates as, as low as we can through this energy transition. Uh, and so a lot of our feasibility work to date has, has told us that this will be a cost competitive option for us uh, by the time we need it. Uh, and we're, it's a big part of our evaluation as we move through the planning phase. Thanks, Darcy and Nanette there. One more uh, on cost, and you may have addressed part of this already. Uh, the question was, any comments or thoughts on the economic feasibility of these facilities? So cost of power to the average person and as well as the cost to the province. Yeah, we, we are very much focused on our customers at SAS Power. Uh, we want to make sure that we, we maintain the grid in a reliable and safe manner and with the, the most cost effective ways that we can do it. Uh, our rates affect our livelihood in Saskatchewan and they affect our business in Saskatchewan. Uh, we're very mindful of that and, and we're very focused on, on uh, those priorities uh, that, as defined by our customers. So I, I can say it's a big part of our evaluation. It's something we look at and we look at the total life cycle cost of the asset. And for nuclear power, that includes uh, managing all of the waste long-term, uh, the operational side of things, including the capital cost of the construction uh, and everything. So it's really an all-in cost that we look for uh, from the power of that facility. And then we can compare all our generation options and, and make informed decisions on what to build and what not to build. Okay, so next question is about waste. So what waste products are produced by a small modular nuclear reactor and how are these products dealt with? Yeah, waste is an important part of operating a, a nuclear reactor. Uh, and so it's something that we're gonna be very focused on and developing uh, long-term sustainable plans to manage the waste products that, that are associated with operating the reactor. When you think about, about nuclear fuel and, and when that nuclear fuel is spent or, or done out of the reactor, it's, it's called used nuclear fuel, uh, which is known as high level nuclear waste in Canada. Uh, there's, the good thing is there's not a lot of volume of it. Uh, it's quite manageable as far as the volume, but it does take a lot of management systems to safely and securely and sustainably store it. Uh, and so we'll be looking, looking to do that on site uh, throughout the life of the, the asset. Canada does have a centralized uh, plan to, to bring all of the used nuclear fuel in Canada to central uh, storage locations. 
and the Nuclear Waste Management Organization is the, the entity that is looking after that uh, on Canada's behalf. That's fully funded by, by the existing nuclear operators in Canada today, but it's run by, by the federal government. And so they have a mandate to take and centralize all of Canada's used nuclear fuel. There are, other, there are other aspects, other waste products that come out. Uh, Life-cycled reactor components come out of the containment area when they're done, and they need to be stored and managed for, for a period of time as well. Uh, even uh, you know, our coveralls or, or paper products and, and mops and stuff like that that has seen some exposure uh, to the reactor itself uh, is considered low-level nuclear waste, and, and we have long-term management plans for, for all of those. But interim, for the interim, those waste products will be stored on site until central uh, facilities are available for, in Canada. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is uh, more about safety here. So are there any health risks for humans or animals from SMR byproducts or the handling of uranium? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Uh, and I, I appreciate that it was asked. Uh, Canada has a long history of nuclear power. We actually, 70 years of, of research, mining, power reactors, and all of that is, is very heavily regulated by the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Uh, and it's been done safely. Uh, there hasn't been a, a, an injury related to our nuclear operations in Canada throughout that history. And that's because of the, the amount of effort that goes into nuclear safety and nuclear security. Uh, and that really is, is that regulatory rigor uh, is a benefit for us uh, when we're considering this new technology. Uh, so you can, you can there, we won't implement a, a nuclear reactor in a location where we would have uh, any impact on the people and the, the wildlife in that area. So there's, there's a lot of, of regulatory rigor and, and management systems that go in to keep nuclear operations safe and secure. All right, so now let's head to some questions about water. Uh, are we, yeah, great. So we have about three different questions. I will start with uh, the first two together, I think. So to have a broader question to start with is what will the impact on the lake be? Um, so what kind of changes might we see in the water? What those impacts might be on the fish um, or other, other, you know, creatures that uh, call the lake home? Yeah, that, yeah, I appreciate that one. It's so we, we the water is used for cooling the facility, and, and we have experience with that at SAS Power. It's a very similar way we operate our coal-fired power stations. So you rely on a water body to cool the steam cycle once you've taken all the electrical energy out of it that you can, uh, and you can do that a few different ways. And 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 so one of those ways is with a once-through cooling system, where we take water from the water body. Uh, we run it through our condenser to cool that steam and the process, uh, and then we return it to the water body. Now it does come returned at a higher temperature, and that has some impact on the water body. Uh, and that impact can be measured and, and we can evaluate it. So we have a lot of work to do to evaluate these particular water bodies with, with that type of technology in mind. Uh, and, and we're going to undertake that over the next uh, many years as we get into the planning phase and the impact assessment. Uh, there's a lot of regulations in that area too. So the way you design your, your cooling water system, you can make sure the intake is big enough so the water moves slow enough that fish can swim out. And we can look at, at locating the place within the water body that minimizes any impact of, of that thermal heat being dissipated through the water body itself. Uh, but there, there, there could potentially be impacts on the water body itself, and that's it's an important part that we need to study uh, as we look get into this further and and look closer within these regions and at these water bodies. Appreciate that response, Darcy. Um, one little follow up on that: there was a comment um, from someone who's very familiar with the Rafferty uh, Reservoir area, and they were wondering. They said this is a relatively new lake, um, as it is and that this will affect, affect fish stocks and natural habitat. And their comment was that Boundary Dam um, you know, already has experiences with this. 
Um, and to this individual, it seems like an easy decision to keep using that water uh, for the cooling water source rather than um, impacting another lake. So it was a comment, but would you feel free to to share your reflections on that one? Oh, that's that's a great comment, and and we really appreciate hearing that. That's the type of feedback we're looking for uh, to gain from the people within these communities, uh, uh, minimizing our the impact of construction and operation of this facility is is the goal of the project and and what we're looking to do. So I I don't have too much of a response other than to say I, we really appreciate that feedback and and uh, keep it coming. On that note, uh, we only have about four, three more questions left in our Q&A box right now. So if we do, but we do have more time. Um, so if folks have questions that are still on your mind or you have a follow up to something you've heard um, from Darcy or Nanette tonight or from another person's question, please feel free to keep uh, populating the chat with those. We, we do have more time and we're happy to, to keep it, the discussion going. It's, it's a great opportunity here. All right, next question. So. Uh, this is about uranium uh, for fuel. So CBC released an article a couple hours ago. Uh, this is coming from one of our, our individuals here. They've seen a CBC article that said the SMR would use uranium fuel that was not from Saskatchewan. So could you please clarify where this fuel is coming from? If it's outside Saskatchewan, what's the long-term plan um, for building an enrichment plant? Okay, I see, yeah. Uh, our SMRs, will use uranium from Saskatchewan, uh, but, but the narrative there, the important thing to understand is that Canada does not enrich uranium and SMRs require a, a very low level, but still an amount of enrichment to be done to the uranium before it can be fabricated into the appropriate fuel and used in the, the type of reactor we're looking at. And so the uranium will come from Saskatchewan, but it will have to be exported uh, internationally to be enriched and then it'll be fabricated into a, an appropriate fuel and sent back to for use in our our reactor operations. That's that's at least the short term, short term plan. Uh, long term, uh, that that supply chain could could change and transition more to to a Canada based system. But for now, uh, we'll have to rely on on an international supply chain to support that requirement for the project. Thanks for that clarification. Uh, what types of SMRs are being considered? Fast reactors or thermal neutron reactors? This is coming from someone who knows some things about <laughs> SMRs. Yeah, that's great. Uh, the, the reactor we've selected as the preferred technology for, for the timeline we have was mirrored uh, is the boiling water reactor, the BWRX 300. And that's the same reactor that OPG has selected or Ontario has selected for deployment uh, in Eastern Canada. And, and through that, through a partnership with them, uh, there's a lot of synergies and, and complements that we can look at in deploying a fleet of this type of reactor. And so we made, we made the decision for that reactor based on the best interests of Saskatchewan. Uh, uh, but that will be the reactor we're looking at building for, for this first project. Okay. All right. So I'm seeing one more open question in the Q&A, but it, again, you still have a chance, folks, if you'd like to, to ask something else tonight, we're, we're here. So one question that's left at this point is, can SAS Power sell electricity into the United States uh, when the nuclear power plant is built? is built wow uh, this person's very confident we built an estevan <laughs> so he said when it's built in estevan <laughs> or wherever it goes uh could it be sold into the us this would be a great way to increase saskatchewan's revenue and wealth what are your thoughts yeah nanette you, you could maybe comment on that one sure that sounds good it was a great question as well and Definitely, I'd like to mention that so we have recently announced that we are building a new transmission tie line into the United States to the Southwest Power Pool. It's going to bring our import capacity or export capacity to the United States up to 650 megawatts, and that'll be installed by 2027. So you're exactly right. No matter where uh, any potential future generation is built, these tie lines will give us that added ability to import or export energy. Anything to add on that, Darcy? Thanks, Nanette, for that clarification. No, I don't think so. I, I, uh, I think that covers it. Okay. One question that has popped up here is about uh, backlash. So this person's 
curious if you're anticipating what kind of backlash you might be anticipating, um, maybe from folks who are very invested in, uh, you know, in renewable energy or green energy and don't see nuclear playing a part in that, that future. Yeah, our, our engagement uh, around the future of power and, and the reasons that we're looking at nuclear is very important. And, and the feedback, uh, we're gonna get a wide range of feedback, I, I would expect uh, from people that have all different kinds of views on, on what is the best energy mix for Saskatchewan. And, and it's really important to us that we, we get all of that feedback uh, so that we can, when, when we're going to make informed decisions, we can do so with, with the best interest of everyone in Saskatchewan at mind. Uh, and so we're, we're definitely expecting uh, nuclear power can be controversial and, and that's the more, even the more reason why, why our, it's important that we're out engaging and talking to people and understanding those views and perspectives. And we're at the start of a very long process to evaluate this supply option among many other supply options as we make this, this transition to clean energy. And so we're, we're really hoping to hear from everyone in Saskatchewan and, and collect all of those diverse views uh, as we move through this, this process. Okay, well, we are at the end of our Q&A list here. I'm gonna, I think we should give it at least 30 seconds just in case someone's madly formulating uh, a question right now. And if nothing comes in, then we will um, we will adjourn for the night. So I'm gonna give it a little bit more time. Um, and in the meantime, we can just remind people that um, there is a lot of great information online. We shared some chat uh, links in the chat tonight um, for the detailed maps of the study areas. If you want to download those PDFs and take a closer look, those are available to you. Uh, we also shared direct links for signing up uh, for one of the learning events coming up and for how to register for both. Um, the engagement hub, which has kind of a neat mapping tool you can use and a forum, you can ask questions and share some ideas. So uh, you just have to register quickly to do that. And then we also shared a link to the newsletter sign up. So if you're looking for some quick action items to stay involved, you could grab those links tonight and get yourself uh, signed up for all of that good stuff. Okay, there was one last question. How many jobs will be created or would be created if the project moves forward? We have, we have done some work in that area as well. Uh, the Conference Board of Canada uh, looked at, at the potential economic impact uh, if we were to deploy nuclear power in Saskatchewan specifically. So for that analysis, we looked at, at four 300 megawatt reactors operating in Saskatchewan and, uh, and there was significant impact on, on our economy here. Uh, we're expecting through the construction phase, it would be about 1700 jobs. Uh, needed to build out the facilities and then once you get into operation uh, for one site with two reactors it would be in the range of about 350 uh, high quality jobs to support operations and maintenance of the facility so that that opportunity is there uh, for the smr project okay <clears throat> thanks for answering that last one so I haven't seen anything else come in in the interim. So I think, and we were seeing our numbers go down a little. So I think uh, we will close it off for this evening. So thank you again to everyone for joining us tonight. It was really great uh, to spend some time with you and, and answer, answer your questions, much appreciated. Um, and thank you to Darcy and Nanette and the background team here for, for being available and uh, sharing information with us this evening. So we will we'll end it there. Thanks again.